Hello, thanks for uh, coming when, when uh, there's so many choices. I appreciate uh, how many of you have turned up to see me. Uh, my name's Tom. I'm that Tommy Hall on several internets. You may know me for retweeting pictures of mountains roughly once per day. Um, follow me if you're interested in pictures of mountains. Um, I'm going to talk about an idea today that um, I had studied before, but was sort of brought to my, the front of my mind by a new book by a contemporary philosopher called Dan Dennett. So, uh, as you know from the title, the topic is Unlimited Register Machines. So Dan has a, a section in his book called The Seven Secrets of Computing Power Revealed. And the idea is to uh, demystify how computers work for, for the layman, or, or uh, as sometimes the, the audience for these books are, is let's say the enthusiastic non-specialist. So like, it's not, not somebody who's prepared to work, but doesn't, isn't necessarily sort of steeped in the theory or whatever. So. Um, what I wanted to do is, is kind of go through a similar process to what Dan does, but then take it a little further. Um, so uh, I'll introduce unlimited register machines and then uh, go forward. And the goal of the talk, or a goal of the talk, is to build up to a, a universal machine. So we have a program that can simulate the behavior of, of any other uh, program. So like a universal Turing machine, which you might have heard of or whatever. So. Unlimited register machine. So the first question, obviously, what is a register? Uh, I'm realizing I've done this, as people have asked me about my talk over the last few days, I've tried to do a sort of five minute version of this talk about a hundred times. So um, excuse me if you've heard all this before, if you've spoken to me in the pub or whatever. Um, so a register is just a location to store a number. It's a, it, it's a, a natural number, it's unbounded, so it can be arbitrarily large, um, but it's, it's finite. You're allowed to use as many of them as you want. There's an unlimited number of them. So the, the contents of an individual one is unlimited in size. You can have as many as you want. It's unlimited, but there's some finite number for a particular program. Um, so you can use as many as you like. Uh, a program is a finite sequence of instructions. Again, it's finite. Um, we don't allow infinite lists of instructions for you to, for you to follow. And there's free instructions in this particular formalism. So the free instructions I have here are not uh, unique. You can have register machines with different instructions, but the free I've chosen is the same as the one in the uh, Dan Dennett book. And I think it's somewhat parsimonious. So the free instructions are uh, end, halt, you're, you're finished computing, uh, increment register N, and go to instruction M. So your uh, lines of your program are labeled, and every instruction other than halt is a go to. So you're incrementing register N move into instruction M, so you're jumping around your program. DEB stands for decrement and branch. So this is the only conditional we have in the formalism. You decrement register N, and then if you successfully decrement it, you go to instruction M. If you try and decrement a register that's already zero, that's your branching condition. So then you're gonna jump instead to instruction P. So that's the only thing our uh, programs can do. And as again, a program is a sequence of these instructions, and you're jumping around them. Every instruction other than halt is a go-to. So hopefully that's simple. Uh, the state of the computation at any moment, there's a program counter which says, well, what line are we on? Of course, that's updated with every deb, deb or inc instruction. There's finitely many registers, each containing a number. So we need to carry that around as we're computing with these things. And of course, there's a program. Our universe, oh, sorry, our unlimited, yeah, I said it right the first time. Our unlimited register machines um, don't modify the program, although I do happen to, to carry the program around in, uh, in the state uh, so that I can draw it. I'll show you in a second. So computation is a sequence of states. You say, what instruction are we at now? We update the state. We jump somewhere else. What instruction are we at now? We, up, we, we execute that instruction. And you keep going until you execute a halt. There's another way that the, the computation might end and this is like an erroneous program, but if you try and jump to an instruction that doesn't exist, that's just considered to be a fail. You've, you've got a sort of invalid program, so we, do, we just halt on that condition as well. Uh, so our first program looks like this, five instructions indexed at zero, uh, and we decrement and branch, remember register one, uh, and then we go to line one, or if it's already zero, we go to line two. So the way that m most books that teach this, teach you how to do it is, you write out the program, you write out a list of registers. You can see what registers are used by going down the, the, after the instruction. So one, zero, two, and zero are used. They're the registers we use. So we've got register one, zero, one, and two. And L is what line in the program we're currently at. So we start by um, 
always at li uh, line zero as a um, convention. And we've, inc we've left register zero as zero in the initial state. That's because for these things, we put our answer in register zero. So register zero should always be initialized to zero. And the other registers, as many of them as you need, are considered inputs to your program. So an interesting thing with these, all these programs, therefore, are variadic. So they actually go from any number of input registers, register one, two, three, four, five, as many as necessary. And then they always give out a single number as an answer. So they're from, uh, but they're all variadic as well. If I was to set register three as, say, seven here, our program would just ignore it. If you look at the, none of our instructions, reference that register. So you could call it with three arguments, if you like, so that every one of these machines is variadic. So we're at line one, and that's the state of the registers. Line one says decrement register one, and then go to, sorry, line zero, the, the first line, off by one error. Um, so <laughs> they, I do that all the time, because the books actually start counting at one. Um, so uh, decrement register one, go to instruction one, otherwise go to register two, yeah? So we decrement register one, that would be now be zero. We jump to line one, so you'd write register one becomes zero, we're now at line one, and then just copy all the other registers. So change the register you're changing, write the new line you're at, copy all the other registers, and then you go tick, 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 answering the same question each time. I think I actually intended to, go, to, go, to give you more examples, so let's go back. So then we're now at line one, which is increment register zero, and then go to zero. So register zero will now be one, and then we'll now be at instruction zero, is that clear? So then we're at instruction zero, and we're saying decrement, uh, register one and then go to instruction one. So register one will now, we can't decrement register one, can we? Because it's already zero. So we're now instead going to instruction two and then the, which will tell us to uh, decrement register two. Is that clear? I think there was, there's definitely a better exposition possible of that. So forgive me if that wasn't clear. But here's, the, here's a simulation of the um, register. So you see we tick around and, and loop, loop in between those first two while it zeroes it out. So what, 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 co what computation is this program actually performing? Yeah, it's an adder. It's adding the two registers, isn't it? So watch again. We flick around here, decrementing one register until it, it's zero, which is our only branching condition. Then we decrement the other register. And every time we decrement, we squirt it into register zero, which is our answer. So yeah, indeed, we have a successfully performed addition. Um, my I realized that the climax of my talk is essentially executing a program that adds two numbers together and correctly, um, correctly finds the answer. So um, I'll try and share some of my enthusiasm with you. Um, <laughs> so another way of uh, representing these is this graphical form. I don't know if you can see my mouse, so I'll try and be, uh, yeah, I, think, I hope that's visible. So, we, one way of figuring out these, so we traverse, R1 minus means decrement register one. The default next hop is the, is the single arrow. The branch on zero is the double arrow. So if you watch what happens here, at the start of our computation, we decrement register one, we then decrement register two, and then until register two is zero, we're gonna keep adding into register zero and register three, and then when register two is zero, we come down and we keep decrementing register three into register two, and then we come back. So this is a little tricky. It's worth thinking through for a moment. So can anybody see what's happening here? Probably. It is a little tricky. That's, gonna, that's the problem with these, unfortunately. You have to kind of think them through for a while. So um, for everything in register one, we decrement it and put it into register two, decrement register three, um, and then uh, copy it into register uh, two. So this is actually uh, multiplication. So um, we, I don't know how best to describe it. Hmm. Um, So, yeah, you, well, you, for, for everything, so this, is, this condition goes around here, the, this first loop, until uh, register one, zero. This, this goes around register two, so 
for everything in register two, so if, on the non-zero case, so register one's initialized with a number, we decrement register one and register two, increment register one, then we keep doing that until register two is exhausted. So register three contains a copy of register um, two. So we, and we've also put a copy in register one. We then copy register three into register two again. So we, we rebuild register two, and then we go and squirt it into register zero again. So we, we copy register two into register three and, and register zero, then copy it back. And we do that as many times as there is in register one. Exactly, you're done. Yeah, so as many times as, you, as there is register two, you copy, oh, sorry, as many times as there is register one, you copy your register two into zero and another register, then copy it back and then do it again. Okay. Again, there's probably a better exposition of that. Um, so excuse me. Um, but so the best way to, to go through these is to step through them and execute them by hand, but we don't have time to, to spend uh, many hours doing that. So. Um, but the, the hope is um, that you're intrigued enough to go away and play with these things a while. Um, Dan Dennett actually does have some exercises, which is unusual for a sort of popular book. He does invite you to um, get used to these and figure out what they do and make your own, etc. cetera. So um, I said before I wanted to do a sort of closure-ish DSL, because this isn't a closure-specific conference. I won't spend too long on it, but sequence of instructions is actually just a, a vector of instructions. Um, and then I've, I have a way of turning them into functions so I can, I can test them and stuff. Uh, all the code's available. But yeah, so we carry around a position, which is where we are currently. There's a list of registers which we're operating on, and there's a program that we're using. Program static. And like all good uh, evaluators, it's basically a case uh, statement. It's what instruction have you asked me to do? Conditionally updating particular registers based on the instruction. So again, I won't spend too long talking about the closure code. Uh, Plus also, to make up for time, I lost explaining multiplication. Um, so Dan Dennett's sort of si three of the seven secrets are, and this is where he becomes a little hand, little hand wavy. So he says, any number can stand for anything. And he gives an example of you know, with the way a computer program can either be Excel or a flight simulator or whatever. And it's fairly standard stuff. We all know we can write programs that do arbitrary things. Um, so he says, all programs can be given a number which can then be passed into a universal unlimited register machine, uh, which is obviously a really cool idea. And it says all improvements of, on the URM, so any fast PCs you've got or whatever, are just uh, speed ups. So the, the power of this device is equal to anything else, so it's equivalent it's the, via so-called so Turing equivalence. So that's the uh, church Turing thesis. Um, so that kind of leaves a big question and answer, doesn't it? It's like, so, oh yeah, so the program itself can be a number. We can operate on that using another program. So I had a look around to see what treatments had um, actually a concrete, universal, unlimited register machine. And I found lots of good resources, but most of them didn't use the same formalism that Dennett did. There was one very good one uh, from Andrew Pitts at Cambridge. Um, so that is the, the URM that w I've built and that we're going to look at today. So in order to do that, though, because our unlimited register machine only operates on numbers, in order to have a function or to have a machine that can take as input a program and take as input the inputs to that program and then simulate it, you need to figure out how to represent programs as numbers and sets of registers as numbers. So we're going to uh, go through that now, um, which takes about 10 minutes as well. So yeah, we're doing okay, I think. Um, so the idea comes from Kirk Girdle. Um, he used it in his incompleteness in theorems because um, it was a, about uh, formal systems and in particular the, uh, the permit of a kind of arithmetic. Weaker systems can be both consistent and complete. Um, so they need to be at least have like uh, as much as an arithmetic. Um, so there's that arithmetization of um, symbol systems was like his key idea. Um, so in order to get lists of things, we're going to go via pairs. So if anyone's ever done lists, once you've got pairs of things, you can get lists of things. So how are we going to encode pairs of numbers? So the trick is we can use the binary expansion of numbers. And we're going to say an example here, 2, 3. It's encoded by, ignore, the bars are just to separate the, the parts of the binary expansion of the number. 
So the number that represents the pair, 2, 3, is going to be this number in binary. So we've got zeros coming in from the right, and there's as many zeros as there is in the thing in the left. So there's two zeros there. Then there's a 1. And then the thing on the left is the binary expansion of the number on the right. Is that clear? So we can, so we can go through. 2R is just the, the way closure does binary notation. Then a 1, then as many zeros as there are. So I can, I can demo it now. If we're saying uh, 2R, or well, let's say code per, and then if we do 5, 2, that's this number. 2R, and then it's the other way around. So the binary expansion of 2 is 10, and then a 1, and then as many zeros as there are the left things, a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That should be the same number, yeah? So we've got a way of encoding pairs of numbers as numbers. Formally, mathematically, that's actually a bijection. So from any number, you get a pair, and from any pair, you get a number, and it goes both ways. Um, it's injective and, and surjective. It's a, it's a bijection. Um, so what we're actually doing here when we do this is we're bit shifting y um, x plus 1 places. So that's the same as time, isn't it, by 2 to the power of x plus 1, if you remember. And then we're flipping that bit in the 2 to the x position. So we want, we want to flip that bit, don't we? So we want to send y over to the left. Then we want to flip that bit, and all the rest will then be 0 if we bit shifted. So it's equivalent to this function. Um, and we can write that enclosure fairly easily. So 2 to the x multiplied by 2y plus 1. So once we've, once we've done code, and the reason I like this exposition in terms of code rather than a mathematical version um, is actually you, you, can, you explicitly have to go both ways. You say in order, to, in order to code a pair, we do this. And in order to decode a pair, you do this. So you say like, Take all, this is not a very efficient way of doing it, but you say keep dividing by two if it does and count how many there are, then, then factor out that, then uh, decrement it and divide by two. So rather than just having this function, which is a, which is a bijection, um, you actually explicitly have to describe the procedure by which you unpick them. And obviously these functions should round trip. Um, so demo pairs I've just done. So once you've got... Um, once you've got pairs, you can build up to lists. And we use the same idea as uh, in Lisp. If you notice, our function actually excludes 0. So the, it, I said it was a bijection between the integers. I slightly lied. We've excluded 1. So the, the, uh, oh, sorry, we've excluded 0. Um, oh, even more bizarre off by one error. We've excluded 0 from this function. Uh, so we can use it. It's not a bijection. I lied. Um, we, use that, we use the fact that it's not, in fact, to code lists. So we have zero as terminal, like, like nil in, in Scheme, where we have a, a linked list. Uh, the second thing of every pair is another pair, and you signal the termination by zero. So we're going to signal termination by, by sorry, in, in Scheme, you signal termination by a nil. We're going to sig signal it by a zero. So if the list is empty, encode it as zero. Otherwise, take the head of the list and code it as the left element in your pair. Take the rest of the list and code it as the, the right element recursively, and of course our, our terminal condition means we're going to keep coding things um, until we uh, get to that zero. So, and then similarly, how do we decode them? We say, well, if, it, if the code is zero, then it's the empty list. That's our special case. Otherwise, decode them. The head is the thing on the left, and I'm using some closure destructure in here, so I'll say it in words for those that don't know closure. It's a decoder list. If, it, if it's zero, the code, then it's the empty list. Otherwise, decode it as a pair. The left thing is the head of your list. The, the, the right thing is the tail of the list, or rather it's the number that represents the tail of the list. If that's not zero, you have to then unpick that one as well, and you're recursing on until the end is zero, so you can recapitulate a list. So how does that look like in terms of the binary expansion? I can say code list of one, two, three. And in terms of the binary expansion, I always forget which way round it is, but I think I've practiced enough the last few days. So it's 3, 2, 1. So we're going, it's the other way around. So it's what it ends on a 1, I think. And then it's uh, 1, and then 2, and then 3. No. <laughs> uh, so it's just the other way around. Sorry. So it would be. Uh, yeah, free. 
It's amazing how stupid I've become when in front of people, yeah. Okay. Um, I, I drilled this. I made a mistake at Euro uh, Closure D, sorry. And I just drilled this the last few days. I like, don't want to mess it up. Don't want to mess it up. Don't want to mess it up. And for some reason, I do. But So that is our way of encoding. So I hope that's clear. And I hope you can see it's, it's much clearer, I think, from the binary expansion. You've got a strategy for taking a num list of numbers and, ret and returning a, a, a single number. And you can see that it goes both ways. So I hope that's clear. Um, so how to code instructions is quite, is quite a, a decent trick. So we've got free instructions, we've got a way of coding pairs, and we've got a way of coding list of things. So if we can find a way of encoding instructions as numbers, programs are just lists of instructions. So if we can code individual instructions as numbers, we can then code programs as numbers. Does that make sense? So that's, that's our goal, is we want to program as a number. And the way we do it is by using a nice, the problem is we've got three instructions. We can encode ij as a number, and we can encode ijk, the list, as a number, but you don't know when you decode it which of those two things it is. So we use a nice parity trick, and we make sure that all the ink instructions uh, go, uh, go to an even first number, and all the uh, deb instructions go to an odd first number. So when you unpick the instruction, the parity of the left thing tells you what kind of thing it is, so, when you want, so if you code an ink, ink instruction um, as a pair of numbers, because we've doubled it, you see we've got 2i, we're, say, we're saying um, that's an ink instruction. If the first thing is, is uh, even, then it's an ink instruction. The second thing is actually just the j part of the ink instruction. Otherwise, we, because we do 2i plus 1 when we code the, the, the uh, deb instruction, we know that when we decode it, the left thing is the first number. The right thing is the pair that represents the J and the K. And we use zero again as a special case. We excluded our code pairs, excluded zero. So we can treat end as a special case as well. So then we can code instructions. And then it's kind of trivial. It's like, well, once, we've got, once we can code instructions as numbers, programs are sequences of numbers, so we can just code them up. Oh, I, I didn't call one thing out, by the way, sorry. Just to, I, I don't think the machine requires this. I, I have ran the machine without this trick. Um, if you use the same code per function to encode the, the second bit of the deb, uh, because it excludes zero, you don't have a bijection between programs and numbers. I suspect the only reason this second code function is, is used, the machine doesn't seem to require it, actually, but then you do get a bijection between programs and uh, numbers. So I'll just explain that. It's, it's simple. It's, there's a different code pair that, instead of excluding zero, just decrements the answer of the other one. So it does include zero. And similarly, before you decode it, you add one to it. So this is a, this is, this is a proper bijection between pairs and um, individual numbers. So I won't spend too long on that because the, I, th I believe the only reason that they do it is so that there is a proper bijection between programs and, and natural numbers. Um, so, yeah, in order to code instruction, depending on what it is, you code the pair and you always double the register or double it and add one to make sure you're in the ink and deb case. So here again, if you, if you happen to know closure, um, this is a, a more succinct and less waffly version of what I just said. Um, if you don't know closure, I should have used a different language that you did know. Um, <laughs> but the, one of the key ideas and, and sort of pleasures I take in this talk is um, actually code, now at a closure conference, one can assume a little bit more, but the idea that actually the, does the code express the, the idea better than the mathematics? I think it does in many ways because you're forced to describe both ways, how you, how you both do it and how you undo it. And also we can know that we're correct by actually executing it rather than um, you know, my description or my mathematics becomes the, the idea in your head or whatever. So it's a bit like um, Jerry, Jerry Sussman and Hal Aberson and SICP talk about, um, you know, using, this, using uh, programming or code or whatever as a way of expressing ideas. And I kind of like, um, if, you, if this is a language you, have, you happen to understand, it's actually a better way of expressing the idea than perhaps the mathematics is even. So clearly we can, we can code programs. So now we're going to have a look and I still have plenty of time, I think, at what, what the universal machine looks like. So we've got a procedure by which now, and this is, this is very tricky, um, but I hope, it, I hope it, I'll give you the highlights of the machine. Um, 
and we cheat a little bit for reasons I'll talk about in a moment. Um, so it, the universal machine, or a universal machine, only uses uh, 10 registers, which I think is quite interesting. The inputs to the program are the program being simulated, like I said, uh, the registers being simulated. Now, that means the number that represents the program being simulated is the input. The number that represents the contents of the initial registers is the input. And then it uses the other registers, um, including some auxiliary registers, to actually uh, simulate the behavior of the passed-in program. So this is a kind of aha moment on the order of sort of first knowing the Y combinator and having that nice aha. And it takes a while to work through and a while to, th to think about. Um, but first, in order to express the idea of the machine, the URM doesn't al allow um, sub procedures or whatever to make it easier. So I'm going to do a spot of wishful thinking and say it'd be really cool if there was a copy command. Because if I increment and decrement registers, it takes ages. And the girdle number of a program is massive. So I can't wait for the heat death of the universe for the registers to sort of increment and decrement to copy the, the register from one into the other. So I had a, I had a copy instruction. I, what, the, idea, the, the idea that the, UR, the universal machine is using is using registers as a stack and pushing and popping things into the stack. Now, it uses the same representation for lists of numbers that we use. And, but there is a, a sort of subroutine that allows you to update a register by pushing something onto the top of the stack or by popping it out of the stack. So we're going we're to add three commands. So I'm going to show you the universal unlimited register machine. A little bit of a cheat because it's a six instruction machine implementing any three instruction machine. But I'll sort of pay that debt uh, at the end of the, of the talk. Um, so the strategy is copy the current instruction. And halt if it's, too, if, if it's too big. If you've told it to go to an instruction that's too large, we stop. Uh, then, um, so we copy, the, we copy the program. We pop the instructions till we get the one we're interested in. We then inspect that. Based on the arity, we decide whether it's ink or deb. And then we uh, pop the registers to get the one we want. We change it, and then we pop the registers back together. Then we put them back in. Then we start the whole process again. So. There's the uh, 17 instructions using six different uh, commands, though. So it's not uh, meta-circular or whatever. It doesn't host itself yet. Um, so I'm, I'll show you the highlights of this. This, I, I no, nobody, I, maybe, OK, it took me a, a good slice of a longish plane journey to, to, to truly understand this. So it would be very unfair of me to go, hey, see, clearly it follows from <laughs> an, an uh, um, so I'm not going to I'm not going to even pretend uh, that, 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 there's a, that there's a real expectation that someone will go aha I get it, but I can I can uh, definitely show you the highlights. So uh, first thing we do is copy the program, then as many times as there's things in the program counter, we keep popping the program so into into another register. So we say pop into that register, pop into that register, pop into that register. So the contents of that register is the uh, line that you're interested in, or rather it's the girdleization of the instruction that you're interested in. So we keep popping, and if we try and pop too many, our program counter is bigger than our program, what do we do? We halt. So that's the first bit, that's the top bit, yeah? So, so far we've explained all of this. And now n contains the instruction that we want to implement. So then we pop it into another location, and remember, based on the arity of the first thing, it's either an ink or a dev. And what, what this is doing here, I'm getting goose pimply. I'm really excited about this. Um, I, I shouldn't have said, said that out loud. Um, so what, what the, the bottom right, um, where we've got the C, decrement C, decrement C, push, pop, push, pop, decrement C, that's the, where we discriminate. Are we odd or even at this point? And that's where we've got our two different paths. So here we discriminate based on the contents of the instruction, what we're going to do. Here's the, this, this, I am unusually excited by this. <laughs> um, the, the N plus instruction is the uh, extra little bit where we wanted, we wanted the, it's, it's a decode star, it's our decode star function. We increment that thing before we pop it because we know it's, this other, it's the, the uh, decrement instruction. And then, we go and pop out all the registers till we get the one we're interested in. We change it, 
and then put it, and then and then put it back together. And then this is reassembling everything, posh and pop until we've reass posh, posh and push and pop until we've reassembled everything, and then we've got it. So um, this will this will I hope uh, give you some joy um, <laughs> when you yourselves pick through it. I, I, I don't. I don't think, with my exposition, but also with the time, anybody's exposition, you would really get it. You have to kind of work through. I hope my highlights help you figure out what is going on at various points. But that is, in fact, um, making the wishes come true. Grandiose uh, slide titles. Um, so we can. Um, oh, I made a thing that graphs them as well, um, turns them into uh, graphs. Um, we can. Take the program, the number that represents the program, the list that represents its input, and we can actually evaluate the universal unlimited register machine, which I showed you before. We can evaluate it, and two plus three is indeed five. So that is, <laughs> I did, um, I did. <laughs> I've, won, uh, I've won five pounds. Uh, off my friend at the back. I should have bet him in dollars because pounds are worth so much less now. Um, I could get people to clap two plus three equals five, so I win. Um, <laughs> so we've got a little bit of a, uh, a debt to pay. I'm running out of time. Um, copy, so we, we cheated and we did copy, but can you implement copy using the free instructions? Yeah. If you want to copy R into S, zero out S, so decrement S and go back to the same instruction. Take R and squirt it into Z and S. So Z now has a copy of, of R, as does S, which is what we wanted. And then copy R back in, sorry, copy Z back into R, yeah? So we copy the register we're interested in. We zero out the register that's the target. We copy the register we're interested in somewhere else. We copy it back into two places, and we've copied, okay? Now, I am going to do push as, a, as an explanation. Again, the subtlety of this is, 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 is rather joyful. So. We, it really is. <laughs> so you start by incrementing Z. So Z's going to be, um, a, a, it's an auxiliary register. L is the thing that we're pushing into. So it's a number that represents a list of things. And what we're trying to do is recapitulate this. We want to do two to the power of X. And we want to uh, multiply that by Y. So we're starting with Y. We want to add one to it, then double it, then keep, mul keep doubling it by two. Keep doubling it by two. Keep multiplying it by two as many times as there is things in X. So uh, we do, this is, our Z, this is our plus one now. We come into Z once. Then we're at the beginning of our loop. And what do we do? For everything in L, we write to Z twice. So that bit is 2Y plus one. And then what do we do? We go, we're done then. So the contents of L is now 2Y plus one. We've done the first bit of this uh, function. Now we go to Z. And Z, for everything in Z, which of course is now contains 2Y plus 1, we copy it into, into uh, L. So L now contains 2Y plus 1. Then we do that as many times as there is things in X. So we go back. Um, so let me get this right. So we, 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 sorry, at this point, we've gone round. So Z plus 1 is the plus 1 bit. Then as many things as there is in L. We add two things into Z, so, that's, so uh, Z is now 2Y plus 1. Then we want to try and do the, we want to times it by 2 as many times as there is uh, X's. Does that make sense? So we're now going to say um, uh, we decrement Z and increment L. That's, that's a copy again, so we're copying uh, that back into L. Decrement, um, decrement x, and then go back to l. So then we're then going to do the same thing again, which this time doesn't double it and add 1. It just doubles it, because we're now starting at l, not at z. So the first time we went around this loop, we added 1, and then we kept going round, adding 2 every time. Now we come back to this loop. We start at l. So this is our actual doubling. We copy it into z twice for everything in l. But l is now 2y plus 1. And we do it as many times as there are things in X. So that's our exponentiation. That's times isn't it? by two as many times as there are in X. Um, I think I said that correctly. I leave pop as an exercise for the assiduous uh, li li listener. The plan was always to leave pop as an exercise, which is why there isn't a clue there to remind me, because I'm not clever enough to remember what the thing is supposed to do. Um, 
So next steps, I would love, so there's a, there's a representation, I think, intermediate between the graph and the list of programs, like a block representation, because very often in our programs we say, do this and go to the next thing, do this and go to the next thing, do this to go to the next thing. So it's naturally quite blocky, but then we have a few exits off it, and I want to do a scratch style um, editor for these things. There's somewhere intermediate between writing the program and, and looking at the graph. Um, I, I want to build a faster interpreter for the free instruction URM. So if you, do, if you, execute, the, if you execute this copy, you get stuck here. You, you, zeroing out a massive register takes ages, and, and copying a register takes ages. If, if you've got the girdle number of a program, it's that many cycles. It's the heat death of the universe before um, you've actually copied it. Um, so, yeah, and then property-based testing, these things are crying out for it because I've got, a, I've got proper bijections between uh, the entire uh, integers and programs which I can then execute. Oh, and also, uh, I can't get the girdle number yet. Oh, by the way, I have expanded out the 17 instruction, 17 line program in the six instruction machine to a free instruction version which is about 67 lines. But even in the Java version of the uh, simulator I've got, I can't get the girdle number of the universal program. And then, of course, you eventually, you'd want, if you had enough computer power, you'd want to feed it into itself, wouldn't you? Um, <laughs> one, can, one can dream. Um, so, oh, uh, somebody said they were really looking forward to finding out the history of this idea. I'm afraid I barely had time to describe the idea. This is a wonderful book. doesn't mention unlimited register machines but is all about um, the, the idea of universality, including uh, some uh, wonderful mathematicians, including how much of a nice chap uh, Boole was. Um, so the, the, this book uses a different formalism, but it's also very good. Um, any questions? And I've already answered the first question. Um, <laughs> any, any, any questions? I know I, I know I got it wrong at several points, but it's fine. Why did I? Didn't you? I mean, why didn't you instead of, um, I mean, you don't want to the first element in the, in the list, like 0, 1, 2. Oh, and, and discriminate based on them? Um, I, well, good question. I, I'm, not, I'm not proposing that this is at all unique or that one only has one choice. I'm sorry, I wanted to stress that along the way. The, the, the particular girdleization chosen, you can see a bit later that it obviously makes it relatively easy in the instructions to, to, to implement. So it's, it's, it's uh, well chosen in terms of later implementation, but you have loads of different choices, loads of different things you might do. Um, absolutely, non-unique. Uh, I, I, I meant to stress that. Yeah? Um, that little point of script demo app you have. So oh, yeah? Can you like, type extra programs into that and execute them and see what they do with things? Eventually. Um, one thing I'm really, I actually lost a lot of time, made that demo in the space of about an hour, then thought, oh great, I'll do the universal machine, then I just got, it just said infinity <laughs> as, the, as the value of the, of the registers. I was like, shit, I'm in JavaScript now, aren't I? Um, and, then, and then I lost, um, I lost many, 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 many Tommy hours were wasted <laughs> trying to get JavaScript to have large enough integers, and then I did it, and then it was too slow. So <laughs> I'm in a very unfortunate uh, situation there. Um, my hope was to, 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 yeah, have that. I think you might have known that. That might have been a troll. Um, well, thank you for your patience and indulgence. I hope you do stare at that slide, and I hope it brings you great joy. Thank you.